Good afternoon. Um, welcome to this webinar from the Business and Local Government Data Research Centre with Professor um, Ali Athlgan from the Sabanchi University. Um, today, Ali will focus on a number of questions um, that can be explored using network models. He'll ask questions such as, in order to reach out to uh, a plethora of people, how do you target uh, a few individuals? And does targeting the same and does the same sorry targeting strategy work for all types of communities? Um, Ali will speak for about 45 minutes. Uh, he'll then address your questions uh, at the end. So you can submit your questions at any time throughout the session via the question box in the panel that's on your right. Uh, but we'll put all of the questions together so that we answer them uh, all together once Ali's finished his presentation. Um, so I think that's it for our introduction. So I'll pass you straight over to Ali um, and we can get started. Okay. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, the subject of my talk is the spread of influence. And I pick up this painting uh, because I will start with square lattices as fundamental building blocks of networks. I'm going to put some color inside the squares. And uh, later on, I will distort them and hopefully the transitions will be as smooth as the fluidity of the music. You know that the Klee was a violinist and music had heavily influenced his artwork. Um, so um, what you see here, it is one of the earliest settlements uh, in Anatolia, his name is Chatalhur. Now it is always possible to have conflicting opinions about issues. And one of the oldest settlements we see here but then why don't you look at it for a second and see anything uh, exceptional you notice? Um, you see, what's interesting? Yes, there are there are houses, obviously, and they are adjacent to each other, and you almost see no streets at all. Then the, the question is, where are the doors? How do people get into their houses? Uh, what's interesting here, uh, they climb up to their roofs and they afterwards sneak into their houses. So they are maybe the uh, initial, uh, so to speak. But the, the, the part here is, um, if you can read the article, it appears in science, uh, that challenges the idea that farming prompted our nomadic ancestor into the first settlements. It challenges that. Maybe the settlements and cities come first and then the agriculture uh, take off. Anyway, you see what you see, a kind of square letters again. Uh, so through here and there, you see some, you know, a uh, few empty places, empty spaces. And um, what's going to happen throughout this webinar, a group of people decided to do something, and another group not to do the same thing. So to buy a designated product or to settle in a specific region. But you see, there are opinions and preferences, and which are not immutable. It is our hand to change these. They are mutable. But what if those preferences are shaped by immutable characteristics, such as color of skin or birthplace? Then what is referred to as the homophily uh, takes place. Uh, you see, um, homophily uh, produces a natural spatial signature. And what is that? Uh, it boils down to the fact that the people choose to live near others like them. So you see the picture on the left is the Chicago in 1940. Uh, the obvious colors, uh, the white and black. And the one on the right belonged to 1960. Uh, so you see, we really observe how concentration of different groups can intensify over time. So which emphasizes the fact that this is a process with a dynamic aspect. But uh, there's an increasing return, obviously, uh, because when you move into there and you're gonna ask for similar colors because you're opening up restaurants, shows, businesses, so there's an increasing return. But first, I really like to laser focus on the first picture, the one belongs to 1940. And I'm gonna ask why and how in the first place this segregation took place. And 
to do this, uh, I'm going to employ an open source agent based simulation software. Uh, many of you may have heard of it before. It's called uh, NetLogo and developed by researchers uh, in the Northwestern University, US. Uh, there are a zillion number of libraries and it is very user friendly. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to adapt uh, the model uh, introduced by Professor Schilling. Who happened to be unfortunately died away last year and almost become a hundred. Uh, he's a Nobel laureate, by the way, in 205. And the study that we're gonna uh, investigate or undertake uh, is the one that he developed in the late 60s and early 70s. But you know what I'm gonna do? I, rather than throwing up the results, I'm gonna roll up my sleeves and I'm going to uh, simulate them with you. So here is uh, the net logo, uh, and obviously you can reach my slides afterwards, and you're gonna see the directions over there, how to get there. So then let me quickly uh, summarize what is happening here. Uh, you see there are uh, numbers here sliding, and I put this in the maximum, there are 200 and uh, rather 2,500 agents, and half of them is green, and the other half is red. As you may have uh, noticed, there are a few black spaces inserted amongst the agents. These are empty spaces, vacancies. So when I click the setup, for instance, uh, you see that different initial configurations are generated. They are random. Now, what do you mean by, by that? For instance, if I just straight myself on a square, uh, and if I say, if the, I flip a queen, if head comes up, I say the lettuce is red. When tail comes up, uh, the lettuce becomes green, for instance. Uh, so this means that uh, this thing is, we can say, uniformly distributed. And each agent here is eight neighbors, classical, north, south, east, west, northeast, southwest, and all eight of them. You see, uh, right underneath, uh, there is this uh, slide. And the slide says, uh, Percent similar wanted. This says that any agent over here will be unhappy if fewer than the similar fraction of its neighbors share its color. So if I am red, um, if I don't have uh, red people, um, uh, at least 30% uh, around me, neighboring me, then I'm going to be unhappy. Okay then what's going to happen? What's going to happen when I'm unhappy? If she's unhappy, an agent, she will move into any vacant place. So how does she pick up which one to move into? Random. What if she will be also unhappy there? She moves further. What if she's again unhappy? She moves further. Uh, obviously, uh, this is true for all the agents. You see then, what we make up an unhappy agent list. Obviously. Because of this requirement, there will be unhappy people around. Uh, you see that uh, right in the screen, there is a percentage of unhappy people. Right now, with this initial configuration, uh, there is almost around 60 to 70 percent unhappy people on the average. Like you can uh, easily observe the thing over there. Obviously, we can calculate this thing analytically, combinatorically, but we don't need to discuss it now. But there are some unhappy people. And what is here also the percent similar, uh, which means that uh, on average, uh, there are 50% uh, uh, people. Uh, well, let me put it this way. Let me give you an example. Suppose uh, I found the red and red surrounded by three reds. Or I indicate another red and let's say that it's surrounded by seven red. Then uh, the average value of this red will be five. So this thing is 50% similar means 50% uh, on it's on the average. Uh, so what's going to happen uh, when there is an unhappy people, we make an unhappy agent list. Uh, we um, put this thing in a, uh, say, uh, a vector, and we randomly select one. Then she moves. Then we pick up another unhappy agent and move that then two. Then we ask the list. Are there anyone in the list still unhappy? This process makes other agents who were originally unhappy or rather happy unhappy. So we prepare a new list. 
uh, until when? When the simulation stops. When everyone is happy, uh, we refer to this as equilibrium. This means that no one has any incentive to move further, then the simulation stops. Uh, any cost involved in this moving process? No. Uh, you may think that these assumptions are really severe, but please put up with me a little bit longer. We will have a point. And needless to say that, obviously, we are able to remove all these assumptions whenever we think that it is necessary. So uh, why don't we roll up our sleeves now and uh, let's say go. Uh, you see what is happening. A uh, number of unhappy people decayed out, reached to zero. That's why no one is moving anymore. Um, what's interesting, though, uh, even though any agent only asks for 30% similar wanted around himself or herself, uh, on the average, it reaches to uh, more than 75%. And you see that this pattern obviously uh, says that uh, rather than starting from a sort of mixed initial conditions, or integrated society, so to speak, and each agent merely asks for 30% similar wanted, you may think that it is definitely a mild thing to ask for it. Right? But if everyone asks that uh, or requires that, then all of a sudden uh, we become segregated. And, uh, uh, you can easily imagine what would really happen if we increase this thing to 40%, uh, for instance. Uh, you see, it is still lower than the half, uh, half of my neighbors. Uh, but then, uh, you see, the segregation becomes even more intensified, and the percent similar uh, reaches to 85%. So the question here, actually, this is not, I mean, uh, this was interesting because Professor Schelling's argument was even the each, even each agent's desire is very mild. The society, if all the agents of the society requires that, then this is inevitable. Then my question is actually, uh, this is I don't see always simulations at the end result of a sociological analysis or uh, the policy making directions. But what I like to do, for instance, I like to ask in the questionnaire. First, this question, uh, what is your requirement? 30%, uh, 35%, even 25%? Then I would tell her or him this result. Then I would ask the agent, uh, what would be the response of hers, provided that in informing her about this picture, this consequence, would he change his mind? Uh, so this is what I think the simulations are for. They are not the end results, but they are designed to crystallize our thoughts, uh, create some intermediate results, and make up uh, better questionnaires for the uh, you know, sociological or political analyses. So you see, uh, if I were to ask a question like this, would you change your opinion? Because you see that the society is segregated now. Actually, that thing been done. Maybe not because of those simulations and everything, but they said that in the United States, especially in the 70s, late 70s, they asked the minorities uh, if they are looking for asking for diversity, they say yes. It might be the fact that they might be concerned about the well being of their offspring. So they are saying that uh, not only do they look for a person similar wanted, but they specifically ask for some diversity. So which means that uh, uh, you see now, in addition to this thing that uh, I'm going to show my collaborators at the end of the presentation, uh, really nice youngsters, they prepared this thing for us. Uh, in addition to the similar wanted, uh, we add non similar wanted, specifically asking uh, a diverse um, neighborhood. So then you see what's going to happen. If I do the setup and if I did do the go, and you see it takes a little bit longer time to equilibrate, but you see what happens. Uh, the percent similars are not really uh, change a lot, but percent unhappy dropped out. But rather than having a green or uh, red clusters, they become a little bit more integrated, but 
system, the backend places becomes the facilitators, and they become the cluster parts. Um, so uh, if I if I come back to my uh, presentation now and uh, show you the results, like this is if uh, all agents are ask, asking for 30% similar and 30 but 95%. So 95% is an upper bound, or meaning another way of saying this, 5% from the other color. Uh, if I do this thing for 35 and 95, you see a little bit more integration and uh, the more uh, clustered uh, areas. Now, what will happen now in that all the cases that we studied right now, so far, uh, the composition of the red and green, uh, they were equal. equal. Uh, now I'm going to define the majority and minority. So majority of people are green and uh, minorities are red. And there are, you see, three patterns there. And here's my notation. The first number in the parentheses indicate the preference of the agents in the uh, majority. The second number, the first one is the majority, and the second one is the minority. So uh, here is the, the, the one in the middle. A uh, majority seeks 25% similar. However, uh, minor, they, they never ask any diversity. Uh, but what happens, uh, uh, minority asks for 5% uh, of the other parties. And here, in this analysis, actually, uh, we have uh, both minorities and majorities asking for the, the diversity. So you see that. Uh, uh, the segregation this year is inevitable. A little bit more segregation, but mostly uh, some of those things are integrated. But obviously, if uh, both of them asking for uh, diversity, these things are a little bit more diverse. And you see now, uh, you can see that uh, 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 the Chicago analysis in 1940s. Uh, May started from one of those, but this is the picture that I show in the 60s, and it became one of the uh, segregated areas. So um, I think we have appreciated so far uh, when the individual chooses to connect to others who are like herself, the society becomes segregated. Uh, now you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to forget the colors, uh, but I, I'm going to still uh, put this thing into my mind that. Uh, the community is locally knit, uh, locally woven uh, because of the homophily, but I'm disregarding the colors. And I'm just going to appreciate the underlying interactions. So I happen to know that there are knits, uh, there are clusters of like people, but uh, the important part, I am not going to take them into account in my analysis now. I am now going to focus on my preferences. Uh, I need to put a little bit of disclaimer here. I know that there are causal links between immutable characteristics and the wealth distribution, uh, but I'm going to tend to forget this thing for the time being. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to assign real numbers uh, to each node now. And these numbers are between 0 and 1. And they are, again, independently and uniformly distributed. Uh, and you see that uh, there are three different patterns here. One is an open circle, the other one is a cross, and the last one is a, a filled circle. So how do, I, how do I get that? What I'm going to do, I am going to exert an exogenous number. Let us call this thing price for the time being. And it can also be, uh, vary between 0 and 1. So uh, the first numbers that I assign between 0 and 1 to all the agents in the network, all right, then why don't we? Uh, call them capitals, uh, the money that they own, so to speak, uh, indicating their um, wealth. And the, the price that we exogenous to put uh, exactly defines the open and uh, cross, uh, crosses, open circles and crosses. This means that if I set the price 0 0.7, for instance, and if this guy is uh, number is 0 0.8, so she is if he is capable of buying that, so it's an empty circle. Uh, if this guy's uh, number is 0 0.4, which is lower than 0 0.7, this means that 
He cannot buy, he cannot afford the product. So this thing is crossed. Then the question is, what is an empty circle? And the empty circle, I'm sorry, the field circle. Uh, the field circle, field circle is the guy who knows the product. Imagine that all the society were using a type of product, say product B, for instance. Now there is a new kid on the block, and this product is A. And only this guy, uh, the field circle guy, is knowledgeable about the product. Uh, the person who did this analysis is Arthur Campbell. This is his PhD thesis when he was graduating from MIT, published this in American Economic Review in November 2013. And, uh, I think he is in the uh, Yale University right now. His idea is how the information of new product is going to be disseminated throughout the society, namely the word of mouth. So uh, here is uh, how uh, the word of mouth propagates. First of all, uh, agents, all agents, must be informed in order to be able to purchase the product. So they first, they're going to hear about it. Then they're going to look at their capitals, and they're going to decide uh, and there's no decision almost here because they, they're going to decide based upon their capitals. So you see what is happening? Uh, then this guy knows the product at time t is equal to zero. No other individual knows nothing about it, but we know their capitals. They know their capitals. And at time t is equal to one, uh, this guy, right now we have for the uh, simple analysis, I'm going to change this thing later, but we have square lattices with only four neighbors. Uh, uh, this guy is informing. Uh, his neighbors about this new product. And because of the uh, two of his neighbors are uh, capable of buying this thing because of the, the price, they can buy it. And you see that this thing is repeated uh, throughout the place. And for instance, this is, uh, uh, this is the potentials node. Uh, you see what is interesting here? Imagine that this red guy originally know the product, and throughout the time, all those things are being informed, because I, you may imagine that the prices here is a little bit lower and almost, you know, uh, more than 50% of those things are capable of adapting it. Now, all the green guys heard about it, and because of the capitals, they are inclined to buy it. At least they are. If they decide to do so, they can. But you see what is interesting? There are some uh, white circles over here. Uh, they are the potential adapters. They are capable. But unfortunately, they cannot buy the product because they have not heard about it. So uh, why don't you look at this picture uh, here? Uh, let us imagine that all these black dots here are the potential adapters, meaning the empty circles. The empty spaces, rather, uh, are actually made out of crosses who are unable to buy the product. You see that if the potential adapters are 10%, or you can say that uh, price is 0 0.9, uh, then there are lots of uh, unable uh, guys, but there are only few potential adapters. And as you can see through the columns, the first column, the second column, and the third column, a fraction of the potential adapters are being increased. Another way of saying this is uh, we can you can lower the prices over here. And you can see that at some critical point, uh, for instance, this guy here cannot inform his neighbors because they're all crosses. And as a matter of fact, up until a point where very close to 60, even though if I pick up any individual here, 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 or there, which is a potential adapter, unfortunately, who cannot inform anyone because he cannot connect it to. All adapters, potential adapters, up until 60 is surrounded by uh, non-adapters, non-capable ones. So he cannot disseminate the information. When it is reaches, when it reaches to this critical point, then it can, you know, uh, find a way around. Obviously, afterwards, things get uh, really going. Now, why don't I uh, summarize you uh, what I said in a graph so we can appreciate it. Uh, now, we are seeing a graph, a horizontal axis, and the vertical axis. The horizontal axis is the uh, fraction of the potential nodes. It means they are, at the beginning, empty circles. 
this means that zero potential uh, nodes means, or very close to zero potential node, node means that the price is very high, very close to one. So as fraction of potential nodes increasing at the beginning, this means that along this way, uh, the price is uh, the price is uh, falling down. So, and what is on the vertical axis is the fraction of the adapters. So uh, you can see that fraction of adapters is the all green ones uh, to the total number of circles. Uh, potential adapters are all circles to the total number of people. So then you see what is interesting. Uh, up until that critical point that I was talking about, uh, very close to 0.6 or 60%, uh, no one, no potential adapters can inform uh, other, other people. So unfortunately, people are, even though they are capable, they cannot buy it. This is the one thing about, a difficulty about the world of math, so to speak. Uh, but afterwards, uh, all the uh, if the prices get lower and the fraction of the potential nodes uh, increase, then uh, all the fractional ones are becoming the adapters. So you see that there is some sort of a critical uh, transition here, which uh, impinges on, as far as this uh, very toyish square network is concerned, this is the fact. Uh, there is another one network here, uh, which is a circle network. Uh, how, how can we get this thing going? So why don't we make a circle, uh, hold our closest neighbor's hand. Imagine that we don't have two hands, but we have four hands. And we have two nearest and two next to nearest neighbors. Then we also our, uh, hold our next to nearest neighbor's hand. So you see that this is me and this is my, me holding my two friends' hands, but also next to neighbor hands. So like this, everyone has four neighbors, but the topology, the shape is this thing a little bit different. And you see what's interesting? For this type of a network, uh, unbelievable. In order to be able to sell the product uh, or uh, uh, for people being able to buy, buy the product, you need to lower the prices a little bit more drastically. That means, this means that dissemination of the word of mouth calculation or diffusion of this uh, fact that there's a new product on the block uh, is becoming a little bit difficult. So you see, it is easier here, difficult there. But what might be the reason for this? Um, what is the crucial difference between this society and this society? If you can think of the following, uh, you can see that if this is myself, and if, if this guy is my neighbor, if this girl is my other neighbor, my two neighbors are not connecting. Uh, so I don't see any tri triangle over there. Uh, there. It seems that all I, my neighbors, my neighbor's neighbors, but now my, my neighbors are not connected to each other. But on the other hand, look at here. This is my neighbor, that is my neighbor too, and they are also connected. So you see, uh, the one on the right, the ring lattice, so to speak, uh, has more knit, uh, more cluster type of structure, and the information really flows around here and cannot go beyond that. So that may be uh, giving us a signal about uh, what type of networks we should be dealing with. Now, what I'm going to do from uh, this Polish examples, I am going to uh, switch to a little bit more realistic ones. And in order to be able to talk about this realistic network, which is referred to as the small world network, which is uh, very popular for the last two decades, we're going to be talking about now, and originated by Professor Milgram, happens to be a, a, social, a psychologist, sociologist, psychosociologist, social psychologist. Uh, what he did uh, in the early 60s, he designed an interesting experiment. He um, prepared 200, a little bit more than 200 letters. And he picked up two arbitrary points in the United States. Uh, one in, uh, say, Omaha, not say, actually he, he did that, uh, Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, and the other one is right there, Boston, Massachusetts. And the, the, you see the distance between this. It is uh, more than uh, 1,300 miles away. Then he, uh, at this initial point, uh, pick up uh, more than 200 different uh, people. 
they are all located in Omaha, Nebraska. Then each of the participants is asked to move the message, the letter, toward the target person using only a chain of friends and acquaintances. They, they are not going to be able to send this thing using the postal services at that time, the mail services directly. They are asked to uh, give to the person, each person is asked to transmit the letter to the friend or acquaintance who told he would be most likely to know the target person. So they are not handing to an arbitrary one. It's got, it's got to be at least an acquaintance, not a friend. But then among the friends, you're going to pick up the one that who might likely know the target person. So for instance, if uh, I know the Boston area, uh, but I don't know the specific person, I don't know whereabouts exactly in the Boston area, but if I happen to know any friend in the, say, some of the uh, guys living in the Ivy League school in up Northeast, then I am referring to them. I am giving them my letter so that I am thinking that at least if it gets to this area, it will be shorter. So messages move only to persons who knew each other on a first name basis. So let's think of the paths or chains, Professor Migram called it, from start uh, Omaha to the end Boston. Okay, if A is the starting point in Omaha and Z is the target point uh, at Boston, suppose that there's a chain from A to one, then to two, then three, four and finally Z, then if you count, a, one, two, three, four, Z, there are four intermediaries. So, Professor Nibram's idea was the following. What would be the number of intermediaries between the beginning point and the end point? And we're talking about early 1960s. Uh, it's hard to imagine. I was born in 63, so uh, I can have some ideas about the late 60s. Um, but what do you think? What would be the typical typical number of intermediaries in the real experiment? Again, the real experiment is in the 60s US. So what do you think? It's 25, 50, 100? But actually, my thinking was along those lines, but you see, this is the real result. Uh, you see in the, on the horizontal axis, uh, the chain's number of intermediaries. That means there's a chain here, uh, with one intermediary, there's a chain here, nine intermediary. But you see, the and these are the number of chains. Uh, more than 200 letters, you see that only 64 of them reach the final destination. And I believe this is also amazing. Uh, I mean, almost a little bit, uh, around 30% or so, I guess. And this is a remarkable success to me. So, um, it is, I think, much shorter than our uh, expectation, at least my expectation. Uh, we see, yeah, again, there are relatively short chains with few intermediaries and long chains, <laughs> relatively long chains, at least they are shorter than my expectation. But you see, the median, median is six. So <laughs> the six actually is the basis of the famous, if I heard about it, 60 degree of separation. That, uh, you know, uh, sprung the idea that all living things and everything else in the world are uh, six or fewer steps away from each other. Uh, this, thing, this thing amazes me anytime when I'm seeing it, when I'm talking about it. How and why such a small number of steps can connect any arbitrary two people in the world? What type of a human network uh, can achieve this? And you see that it's, it's not a, a square lattice, neither is a uh, ring lattice. Well, what, do you, what do you think? Uh, the very first thing comes to our mind is like tree-like network. You know, I recall our kids will always demand the formation of chains like this. In case of a news to be propagated, I knew whom to call. Uh, uh, the person that I call needs to call this. So it's, it's, it's a chain step. And you see that it's, it's very efficient in this, in this way. A uh, number of growing steps by powers of, if I were to have, for instance, 100 uh, at each step, it got 100 million. Obviously, 100 friends is a little bit an overstatement, but you see that how, if, for instance, five here, 25, 125, unbelievably huge number of steps at the beginning. But you see, this is not a friendship network. This is not the humans are like. Uh, why? Why? Uh, 
if we design that way, man-made design, if we specifically designing a network which really propagates those things, it may be the case, but the real networks are not like this. Uh, you see, uh, what, what, what is really happening here? Uh, let, let me observe two things. First, why don't uh, I call a node A? And if I have, for instance, uh, two neighbors, for instance, it's me, and, and this is me, and this is my first neighbor and the second neighbor, and you see that there's a strong probability that uh, we discussed a couple minutes ago, there's a strong probability that they also happen to know each other. So we're not talking about a tree structure here. And so this means that in order for me to get uh, from here to my friend, I can also do that. Or if I am going to go from an arbitrary point from here and to there, I don't need to go to the beginning and get there, but I can have several of that. So this means that my second observation is there are sort of jumps between one group, uh, this groups, to the other group over there. So there may be some clusters, there may be some net structures, but there are some short paths and jumps between them. Why don't we dwell on this a little bit more? Uh, let's say that, uh, for instance, if this is a toyish network, uh, we have nodes. Uh, then it is most probable that if A knows B and if A also A knows C, then it is definitely within the reach that uh, B and C also be uh, uh, going to be friends. Uh, not only B and C, but A and F is also going to be a friend. And what's the difference between A F and B C is that A and F has two common friends, but B and C has one common friend. So it may be possible that. If we have more common friends, it may be it may ease the, our friendship. And the other thing is, uh, we may have clusters, uh, but we may have bridges between the clusters. Uh, maybe they are not observable like this, uh, but maybe there are some shorter, way, uh, longer ways to get that. Uh, which means technically they are higher spans from here to there. I may not be know even that. There are those things available, but uh, those bridges, the links between the clusters are also important. So what we discussed so far, hopefully, the principle that we connect to others who are like ourselves. And the other thing is, we have some bridges. And uh, sociologist Gronovater uh, originally called this weak ties. The links to acquaintances that connect us to the parts of the network that will be otherwise far away. So, uh, what happened uh, in 1998, uh, Professor uh, Strogas and his graduate student then, uh, Watts, created this model. They started with the uh, regular ladders, like we did. Everyone has four connections, my nearest neighbors and next to nearest neighbors. Then a key step, they, for instance, kill this regular tie and connect this thing arbitrarily to some other tie. And uh, step by step, they increase this random length. And as a matter of fact, the p probability here is basically uh, the ratio of random links to the total number of links. If p is equal to zero, there are no random links here. If p is equal to one, uh, all links are random. So we have a regular network and a random network. So what is changing between them? It's unbelievable. You see, in the horizontal axis, we have the uh, ratio of random links to the non-random, the total number of links on the vertical axis, this so-called clusters. Uh, if I have a friend one and two, what is the probability that uh, there will be a connection between the two? So this is so-called the clustering coefficients, or you may refer to them as local motives. On the other hand, this thing is L, the average path length. How short uh, or how reachable I am uh, by the other nodes, or how short, in how many short distances I can reach the other guy. You see what is amazing here? In as much as, as soon as you introduce the random link, the paths become shorter. And even 1%, 1.5%, uh, or at least two, at most 2% of the links are random, then all of a sudden you see that the distances become unbelievably shorter. Though at that time, you have still the motives. 
So this region, uh, Vats and Strogat, they beautifully call this a small world region. So it is the topo typology or typology or topology rather the network is, it's a network that makes the net homophily uh, clusters preserved, but at the same time with few random links uh, makes all the people reachable. So this is the, the small world society. For instance, uh, could have reached the, uh, the ex-president Obama in two steps because I have a friend of mine happens to be doing PhD and his advisor is advisor of Professor uh, the President Obama. So two steps. Um, so you see now what I'm going to do. Uh, I will take uh, this analysis and observe. This is what you observe with the square lattice and the rig lattice. And this is how uh, the small world networks, this price lowering or fraction of higher fraction of adapters are cultivated. You see, as I introduce more and more random links, I don't need to lower the prices that much. And my word of mouth propagates nicely. So in the random networks, uh, uh, diffusion is unbelievably efficient to cover almost all the networks with the lower uh, prices. So the balance here is uh, 0 0.1 to 3. Uh, we're still having the motifs, local structures, but short links. So this says that for the real life networks, this thing is nice. Now, what I'm going to do, I will now take into account the preference of my neighbors, not only my capitals, but my neighbors. So uh, why don't I see that, say, say that, say that uh, I am this guy here and I have seven neighbors and four of them are B and three of them are A. Uh, so if, for instance, if I'm going to adapt this thing, uh, I may look for the majority. So if uh, four is greater than three, then uh, B guys, if they are B guys are using the product B, A guys are using the product A, then I would tend to choose the product B. Uh, so, but the important part here is uh, maybe the payoff of this product A to me, if I call this thing A, maybe is a little bit bigger than B. Uh, so now in that case, um, my threshold will be, if there will be no uh, payoffs, my threshold will be half. If uh, at least half of my neighbors should pick up the new product so that I would. Uh, but if there are different payoffs of A and B, then Q is my, for instance, you see that if A is equal to B, then my threshold to switch to product A becomes one over two. But if, for instance, uh, A becomes uh, higher and higher, my switching threshold becomes lower and lower, so I can easily adapt that. Uh, so you see, this is what we're going to be doing now. And this is a toyish network right now. And all I'm going to assume that all the net guys in the network, uh, all the agents in the network are adapted, uh, have already adapted the product B. Now there's a new kid on the block and the product A. And I only uh, put a viral thing on my uh, agent 7 and 8. And then, I am really thinking how this thing is going to propagate along my network. First, I need to inform them through my connections. Then I'm going to look at if enough of my neighbors with the payoff already adapted that. So you see, uh, just I pick up A3, B2, and then my threshold uh, number becomes two, two, five, uh, 2 over 5. You see what happens? If 2 over 5 is the case, first, why don't we go back? Uh, let me look at five, for instance. Five has three neighbors, and two of them adapted, so two-thirds. Two-thirds is greater than two over five, so five can adapt. Uh, how about nine? Nine has one, two, three friends, but only one of them adapted. So at this stage, nine cannot adapt. But it doesn't have to adapt all the guys at, at the same time. Uh, it can diffuse and propagate, like, for instance, first, uh, Five can adapt and 10 can adapt. Then four uh, and nine can adapt. Then six can adapt. So you see information and adaption uh, goes a little bit delay, but uh, all this cluster uh, can adapt that. But you see what's interesting? Uh, no other guys are willing to switch. What's 11, for instance? One or three, one or five, uh, one or three, one or three. So, you see, even though 
they can inform those guys, but not enough of their neighbors are adapted so they cannot finish the product. Uh, so you see, the spread of a new behavior can stall, can stick in one place, cannot get out of this place. Uh, it cannot break this thing tightly the community. So you see the homophily. We tend to forget the color and uh, uh, the immutable characteristics that form the net structures. Net structures often serve the barrier to diffusion and making hard for innovations to arrive from outside of density communities. So what I'm going to do right now in my uh, last five or uh, six minutes, I am going to uh, I'm going to uh, combine these two ideas, the capital idea, the neighborhood idea. First, I'm going to call X not willing to, not willing to buy the product, not willing to adapt the idea, not willing to follow the crowd. And on the other hand, open circles, I say I am going, I am willing to. Yeah, but not willing to, depending on the exogenous reset, uh, idea or the price level. Circle willing to, I am willing to, but I don't know I am going to do this thing at the end because I don't know if enough number of uh, people have already done it, have already adapted it. So let, 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 let me go through this thing with you. Uh, this here, uh, initial propagator. Uh, circles are, they can adapt because they're capable. Uh, on the other hand, crosses cannot adapt as before because they are incapable. So what's going to happen? First, I am going to inform my neighbors. Okay, I'm going to inform my left, I'm going to inform my right. But they don't know if they are going to adapt it because they need to check for their neighbors. So first, uh, this thing needs to diffuse all those greens. Then afterwards, I am going to eliminate the incapables, uh, incapable of doing those things because of the uh, their neighbors. You see, this guy cannot adapt because two of the three neighbors can. So. This can too, and you see, fall down to this. And unbelievably, even though number of potential adapters are high, if I set stage that enough of my neighbors are going to adapt this, if I put this stringent other opinion, uh, other criterion on this, only a small set of things can adapt. And those things are also very uh, initial dependent. You see, what I'm going to do, I'm going to originally switch. I'm going to make this thing to circle. I'm going to make this thing to cross. And you see, when I make a single switch, rather than this set, all those blue sets now are adapting. So how can we generalize this thing to uh, different types of networks? You see, similar graphs are taking place. But now, um, the price level, if we are going to do the small bird analysis, uh, you see what's interesting? In order to be able to propagate this thing, to do, disseminate this thing to the whole society, I need the randomness. In order to be able to uh, rely on my neighbors, if I'm going to act my neighbors, I need the motives. So these two things can combine into small world analysis. Uh, they're going to disseminate the information as fast, as capable as random networks do. Uh, on the other hand, when they're going to come together and decide this thing with their communities, and they need the motives. So that's why uh, the small world behavior for this combination of those two things are imaginably unbelievably nice. So at the almost at the end of my presentation, I'd like to share with you uh, my um, young young uh, fellows. Uh, these three were my um, MS students way back, and now they are at the PhD students at the uh, Texas at Dallas. These are my students now in Sabanji about to graduate. And uh, I like to thank you for your attention and uh, thank you. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, Ali. You've certainly covered an awful lot on, on networks um, and how we can uh, look at all the different various ways of influence uh, throughout throughout that presentation. Um, we, uh, If anyone would like to submit any questions, um, please uh, do so. But I appreciate there was an awful lot that Ali covered there. Um, just to let you all know that the uh, slides from his presentation and the recording of the presentation will be available on the uh, centre's website. Uh, so you can go back over, uh, view it again and look at the slides. And I believe NetLogo is 
uh, free to download so you can download that and have right. a play if you've not done that before um, um, maybe I can I can provocate a question uh, this thing is from the economist uh, published in uh, I believe November uh, 2017 just a few months ago and it shows here uh, in the United States Democrats and Republicans consistently liberal and consistently conservative side you see uh, there is this overlap in 1994 and even though a decade after there is a certain definite overlap between that but you see what is happening in 2017 uh, these two sides are their uh, common ground or their interacting area uh, becomes less and less and I may provoke you to think about this thing would it be possible to explain this behavior based upon the observations that uh, we made throughout the presentation thank you for that so it's really fascinating how um how it's changed so much over a fairly short space of time. So I think if we've got no no uh, specific questions that are coming up, uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll wrap up uh, for now. Uh, but as I said, uh, the slides will be available on the on our website, so everybody can download and, and have a look at those. There's a lot of information um, that Ali covered throughout that. Um, presentation. Um, so I just wanted to say a thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, I really hope you enjoyed it. Um, a lot of food for thought. Um, and I want to really thank Ali uh, for his um, for his brilliant presentation. Uh, it was really engaging and I, I felt like it, it covered um, an awful lot. Um, so once again, the slides and the copy of the presentation will be on our website. So I just want to say th thank you all one last time. Uh, thank you for uh, you all uh, mediating this for me and uh, sharing all those uh, interesting views with you all guys. Thank you. Thank you.